Episode number 147. Aunt Marsh put on her glasses and took a look at the girl, for she did not know her in this new mood. Meg hardly knew herself. She felt so brave and independent, so glad to defend John and assert her right to love him, if she liked. And Marsh saw that she had begun wrong, and after a little pause, made a fresh start, staying as mildly as she could. Now, Meg, my dear, be reasonable, and take my advice. I mean it kindly, and don't want you to spoil your whole life by making a mistake at the beginning. You ought to marry well, and help your family. It's your duty to make a rich match, and it ought to be impressed upon you. Father and mother don't think so. They like John though he is poor. Your parents, my dear, have no more worldly wisdom than a pair of babies. I'm glad of it, cried Meg stoutly. And Marsh took no notice, but went on with her lecture. This rook is poor, and hasn't got any rich relations, has he? No, but he has many warm friends. You can't live on friends. Try it, and see how cool they'll grow. He hasn't any business, has he? Not yet. Mr. Lawrence is going to help him. That won't last long. James Lawrence is a crotchety old fellow, and not to be depended on. So you intend to marry a man without money, position, or business? and go on working harder than you do now, when you might be comfortable all your days by minding me, and doing better. I thought you had more sense, Meg. I couldn't do better, if I waited half my life. John is good, and wise, he's got heaps of talent, he's willing to work, and sure to get on, he's so energetic, and brave. Everyone likes, and respects him, and I'm proud to think he cares for me. Though I'm so poor, and young and silly, said Meg, looking prettier than ever in her earnestness. He knows you have got rich relations, child. That's the secret of his liking, I suspect. And Marsh, how dare you say such a thing? John is above such meanness, and I won't listen to you a minute if you talk so, cried Meg indignantly, forgetting everything but the injustice of the old lady's suspicions. My John wouldn't marry for money, any more than I would. We're willing to work, and we mean to wait. I'm not afraid of being poor, for I've been happy so far, and I know I shall be with him because he loves me, and I... Meg stopped there, remembering all of a sudden that she hadn't made up her mind, that she had told her John to go away, and that he might be overhearing her inconsistent remarks. And Marge was very angry for she had set her heart on having her pretty niece make a fine match, and something in the girl's happy young face made the lonely old woman feel both sad and sour. Well, I wash my hands of the whole affair. You're a willful child, and you've lost more than you know by this piece of folly. No, I won't stop. I'm disappointed in you, and haven't spirits to see your father now. Don't expect anything from me when you're married. Your Mr. Brooks friends must take care of you. I'm done with you forever. And slamming the door in Meg's face, Aunt Marsh drove off in high dudgeon. She seemed to take all the girl's courage with her, for when left alone, Meg stood for a moment, undecided whether to laugh or cry. Before she could make up her mind, she was taken possession of by Mr. Brook, who said all in one breath, I couldn't help hearing, Meg. Thank you for defending me, and then much for proving that you do care for me a little bit.